Well, I, um, it, it's, it's very unlikely that I'll ever win the Nobel Prize for Medicine. But you, even, even if, I, if I did get a, a call to come to, to Stockholm, um, it wouldn't compare for a nanosecond with the, the sheer joy, um, pride, and utter surprise and sheer sense of honour um, I felt whenever Andrew asked me to be his best man. Um, at the time, we were driving at high speed on a country lane, and I, and I thought I should really show how much this meant to me by putting the car into a hedge, because that's what people do. <laughs> But I, I, didn't, I didn't want to um, lose my no claims bonus. So, so, so in, in the following few minutes, I, I'm just going to try and put into words everything that Andrew means to me. Um, a defining aspect of Andrew, and I think this is probably true for anyone who's known him in any of his many, many walks of life, um, it's a plethora of nicknames he attaches. And um, this is really going to confuse his biographers, so maybe they'll see a recording if this will make some sense. But it started off, of course, with, with Andrew. Um, but in the womb, he'd be known as Shadrach. <laughs> so, <laughs> and this, this then, in the teenage years, something then happened. And it became Andy Man, and then Manjo, and then Manj. And at home, for years and years, He's been known as Rue, um, which just sums up everything about his springy and delightful nature. Um, and, and now, now the, the deep joy is that um, he has found a fantastic person to call him Honeysuckle. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever name Heather chooses. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Heather is, is a fantastic name as well. And I, I've often imagined that it's one of the most beautiful names that a woman could have. And that the ideal Heather um, would be a, a raven-haired beauty um, with a razor-sharp mind and blessed with both charity and charm and bountiful measure. And that here she is tonight! <laughs> I, I for one am thrilled. <laughs> The first time that I actually met, well, the first time I saw Heather was years and years and years before I actually got to meet her. And I was in Andrew's room, and there was just a starburst of photographs across all the walls. And he seemed to have taken most of them in moments of high excitement. And a lot of the people had the expressions that you normally see on the National Geographic channel when at Christmas they try giving um, champagne to monkeys and see what happens <laughs> and film the results. And, but in the middle, in the middle of just this, this jubilant cascade of chaos, somewhere in every shot, you can see this dark-haired lass who flashed a glance in his direction, which I'd never seen captured on film anywhere other than the cover of Vogue, or perhaps <laughs> in a Catherine Hepburn movie when she sees Spencer Tracy, or when Maid Marion sees Robin Hood and um, causes chaos with arrows. It just seemed to radiate cosmic mystery and, and beauty and lots of other things. And I thought, either this person is exceptionally good at having her picture taken, or else there's a very significant connection between the photographer and her. And I should have asked Andrew uh, what was going on, but being two Irishmen, and thus completely incapable of talking about our feelings, we spent the evening discussing House of Commons reform, uh, playing cards and listening to the Pokes. <laughs> and then, and then ye years later, years later, rumours started to, to, to reach my, my shell-like ears that the most important relationship between Yorkshire and Ireland since the 1867 Potato Export Agreement <laughs> was, it was in the process of coming forward. And Auntie Paddy and, and, and Drew, they told me about this girl called Heather, and they said, the first time you meet her, you like her. And then you start to love her, and then you see her again, and you love her even more, and it just escalates. And I was like, oh, how intriguing. You know? And so Andrew and I found ourselves back and standing on the soggy banks of the, the van. And Viking raiders used to come down this river in Ireland and carry off the woman folk. And I was feeling quite apprehensive looking at Andrew, thinking he's about to be snatched off to some far land by some mysterious raider. So I said, do you think you might marry her? And Andrew said, I certainly hope so. And you have gadzooks. And then years went past. <laughs> and, you know, middle-aged men um, seem to cope with the absence of a loved one by going out into the garden to dig. 
<laughs> Andrew tore up half of Ireland. Like a, a love-crazed mole, he burrowed across <laughs> the, the north-south border, spewing mountains of earth in his desperate wake. Now, officially, he was laying a gas pipe <laughs> uh, I've seen the photographs, and he's standing in those fields surrounded by earth, wearing his fluorescent jacket and a yellow helmet. He doesn't have the face of a civil servant, but in his blue eyes there's the steely determination of a man who's thinking, I want to be in Pontefract. <laughs> and some, some good has come of Andrew's digging. Um, the heat and light are going to flow out of these pipes, and families are going to clap their hands in delight, and dogs will wipe their tails harder, and goldfish will, will go an extra laugh. You know, Heather, you have funneled even greater energy and joy into our house. It, it was in a convent in, in Darlington that Heather and I finally got to, to meet. And Oh, it was, it was wonderful. If I'd been allowed, I would have rung the bells in, in celebration. <laughs> and, well, this is the night of jubilation. Um, if there are metaphorical bells to ring, tonight is the night to ring them. Um, a new journey is beginning. Um, there are people here tonight who, perhaps this is your first time meeting, but who knows, friendships could be born that could continue for years. It's a glorious collision between the Pendles and the Williamsons and so much more. Andrew and Heather have broken into the signal box and engineered an intersection, which is a celebration. <laughs> and, you know, tonight also, long after we've forgotten the, the label on the wine bottle, we will remember the beauty of the bridesmaids. Um, seeing them arrive, it was a shining diamond flanked by rubies. And could I propose a toast? Was it Tessa and Emma? <laughs> year on her frequent visits to Cardiff and Andrew oh, is the, that they have the most spectacularly, in some ways unspectacular faith. Um, it's, it's not a religion um, which is a thing which is shrouded in mystery, but rather it's the core of their existence. And they believe that there's a, a logic and a love at the very core of the universe, and that the force at the heart of everything is actually looking at his creation with the love of a parent. And that the universe isn't a horizon of loneliness, but it's actually the expanse of an embrace of love. And their lives are just doused in the eternal. And I think today we saw that mystery suddenly coming to life before us. In their love for their parents, which is absolutely true, um, and the way that they cherish their fantastic friends, who today have had the privilege of seeing that they also share that glorious connection. There is just a joy that's unfettered. And this past year, Andrew, it's been a thrill to have you in Cardiff, to see you in the wilds. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew has a knack for friendship, which astounds me. He made Cardiff seem as exciting as Kathmandu on a Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're a cooking, joking, occasionally racket-throwing, wine-hoarding, body-boarding, bass-playing, arrow-shooting, west-wing-loving, gravity-defying force of nature, and I love you. <laughs> and Heather, wow, you're a princess, and you also can explain why the sky is blue. <laughs> The one of the first times I met Heather, she told me about a group of people called the Blue People of Kentucky, who actually are coloured blue, and I was amazed by this. And you can also, I'm sure, explain how lightning works. I can't, but I'm so glad you struck Andrew and exploded in our midst. <laughs> Welcome to the family. Thank you.